Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome to the Savage North. We're here today far, far away from our homelands in the fancy Tooth Mountains, farther north than even our northern capital. Today, we find ourselves in Ogred Shin, the Swamp of Brightness. A murky pool of tangled vines, mud, sludge, brambles, and murk. But like any tarnished gem, all it takes is a little bit of polishing to get something to shine up nice. It is postulated that beneath this murk lies a dwarven fortune. Iron, gold, silver, and much more imperative to our needs, monsters. Down in those sun-forgotten grottos below lurks a menagerie of gruesome creatures. Creatures with plated hides and gnashing teeth. Creatures that we intend to hunt. And through this relatively simple act, we will be bathed in illustrious splendor. Now, of course, before we delve down into this fetid marsh, we do have a slightly more noticeable target right up here on the surface. In fact, it's due to this target alone that we've embarked in such a strange location so far from home. You see, this malodorous marsh is not only home to twisting vines and stinking sludge, it is also home to a primordial shrine constructed long, long ago, in a time before dwarves, men, goblins, demons, and even the elves. This place was constructed by forces unknown. The elves call it Sparogirdo Aredvin, Rain Fords, the Foggy Beach, a muddy span of salt loam thrust through with fingers of dolomite that reach towards the heavens above. Its true purpose remains unknown. Was it to serve as an altar to some eldritch god? Perhaps it was a gathering place for some time-lost people. Perhaps it sits as the remains of some larger construction, a tower, or perhaps a grand temple to some bygone deity. All speculations hold potential truth, but the theory that most scholars today contend must be most accurate is that Sparogirdo Arethifin was constructed to serve as a prison. But a prison for what, you might ask? A valid question. Sparogirdo Arethifin is home to a primal being, older than even the gods themselves, the Marsh Titan, known as Rofa. It is the only one of its kind. It has large mandibles and it has a regal bearing. Its periwinkle scales are round and close set. Beware, it's poisonous. Bite. The Marsh Titan Rofa is associated with water, plants, nature, muck, and animals, and will soon also be associated with hunting and trophies. If we have anything to do with it, that is. This Marsh Titan is our first target, and a glorious day will it be when we fell that beast by our own spears. But who, might you ask, would be daring enough to take on a primal being like Rofa, daring enough to plumb the depths in search of forgotten beasts to battle? Why, if we have a look over here, we see a small group of dwarves. They've embarked from Kivish Uzal, the Lancer of Oiling, and they call themselves Shistatobak, the Garish Pillars, led by sturdy Kivish Akrulzantir. They've come to this place to found a fortress and a legend. They figure it's high time to carve themselves a place in history. And who could blame them in this new age? Why, it seems ripe for it. And it is from the muck of this decaying mire that their legend will bloom. The legend of Locum Kor Zugablulakun Obak. Spear Cavern. The Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. Strike the Earth. Okay, dwarves, ready to get down to business? I think so. Now if we have a look here, we can see all of our dwarves milling around our wagon, just sitting there, surrounded by animals, and absolutely filled to the brim with supplies. Now our first order of business, and it's gonna be an important one, is to get all this stuff put somewhere safe. 
because if we zoom out a little bit here, you can see that shrine is really actually pretty darn close to us. If Rofa wanders over this way, it could very well uh, be a bit agitated by our presence. I couldn't rightly blame it. And so that being the case, um, well, let's have a look around the area, see if we could find a good place to set up base camp. Zooming out a bit more, we can get a better idea of what this place looks like. And more or less, we're kind of located on a slope. It kind of runs downhill from west to east. Over in the west, we have the hills, and in the east, we have the mire. And located fairly centrally, we have that shrine. Um, well, having a look up this way here, up to the north, we can see there is a pretty wide, flat tract, just kind of located on this slope. I'm thinking that this would be a nice little staging area. How's that sound? It's far enough away. Certainly farther than the wagon is right now. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a plan. All right, dwarves, get those supplies moved. This is going to be a pretty tall order of business, I think. However, while it gets done, um, I think maybe we should get some preparations in order too. We're going to have Zan over here cut down some trees because we're going to use wood to make our initial furniture. And as for our starter fortress, we're going to have Moral come over and dig out a little burrow down here, just in this silt loam. It'll get the job done for sure. Now I figure as we're bringing these supplies over, we can get a little rundown of the items that we have with us here. Nothing too fancy, but we did make sure to bring a bunch of different cloth varieties, silk, wool, plant cloth, and some leather too. Wild boar leather. It's got that bristly fur to it, but it's cheap enough, which is great. And we also bought a whole bunch of copper tools too, like picks, axes, and spears. Very important there. We want to be able to defend ourselves right off the bat if necessary. On top of that, we also brought a few extra drinks with us just to get us started, you know. And we didn't really bring anything made out of wood because we could just make it here. We're heavily forested and all super easy. Noticing already that we have some rats over here pestering with our supply. That's pretty annoying. And unfortunately, we didn't have the foresight to bring cats with us. We'll have to maybe pick some up when the caravans arrive in the autumn, but we have a long way still. However, as far as animals are concerned, what we did bring with us are some nice dogs. A whole group of them. We figured they'd be handy for some light guard duty. Maybe they can assist our hunters. We opted for some sturdy Lemlorna tigs, a breed that had originated with us Lancer of Oiling Dwarves. It means fancy biter. And sure, they are fancy to look at, but it refers more to the mountains where we came from, the fancy tooth. They are sturdy dogs. And we kind of had a bug in our brain to try to maybe uh, breed up a new strain here for our dwarves. I think that'd be an interesting project for sure. These ones here are kind of uh, bottom of the barrel scrapings, but maybe we could do something with them. We'll whip them into shape, that's for sure. And aside from our hounds, we also have some sheep, just a pair of them, male and female. They should serve us well. They'll provide some nice wool for us in this northern climate. Can make some nice warm garb from that for sure. These are of the Onal Jagetres' breed, mountain horn hair, known to be pretty surly, but so aren't we dwarves. A perfect match for sure. Oh, something's going on. Let's uh, have a gander. Ah, yes. It looks like Rofa has left the shrine and has moved down here towards the mire, where thankfully our dwarves are not anywhere near. It's quite a distance away, and it looks like Rofa has found itself a meal in this giant grasshopper. My goodness, what a mess. Yeah, I guess I didn't imagine Rofa would go so far from the shrine. That is disconcerting. I am really just hoping it either stays down here or that it goes back to the shrine. Truthfully, we were kind of hoping to get water from these pools down this way. Oh, it is moving though. Back to the shrine, back in the shrine's direction anyways. I'm sure that's where it's headed. Ah, yes, there we go. Back in its shrine. Okay, so I, I don't know what tempted Rofa out of the shrine initially, but maybe it chased the grasshopper for a ways. Maybe the grasshopper dared step foot into the shrine and, and chased it back out. Yeah, let's uh, try not to agitate this titan too, too much. Still got to get some big plans in place. Anywho, panic averted for the time being, and back over here you can see our dwarves busy at work making some furniture, taking a little break from moving stuff to the stockpile. But while we're getting it done, we're taking closer note of our surroundings. This is a fairly exotic area to us dwarves. We haven't seen a place like this before. In fact, if you have a look up here, we have a vine. It's very long and twisting, a bit whip-like, hence the name, a whip vine. They're all over the place out here, and we have seen them before. The elves used to trade them to us regularly back when we were still trading with them. But us dwarves don't typically have a chance to harvest them by hand. 
It's a unique opportunity. I believe they could be brewed into whip wine and also milled into flour. That should be an interesting process. And actually over here you can see a bush, a berry bush, a prickle berry bush. We're pretty familiar with those too. Again, we used to trade the elves for them back when we were on good terms. And those as well can be brewed and probably cooked too. I'm not too sure the exact process is going on here, but we'll get it all sorted out before long. Certainly we're gonna take as much advantage as we can of this place while we're here. Might as well, right? It's home. More astonishing than those vines or those berries though, are these trees over here. We've seen quite a few and they would be very hard to miss indeed. Absolutely titanic. We've never seen trees like this before. The trunk alone is as wide as a tower. This here is a highwood tree. Extremely impressive. Some dwarves like them for their magnificence and well, you can see why. Huge. And it's covered with these lovely flowers too. Little blue flowers, bundles of them. And they appear to be in bloom now. You know, those elves may be a bit off their rocker with their whole nature fascination, but they're not all wrong. Nature can be pretty beautiful sometimes, and that's coming from a dwarven perspective, so it's not said lightly. That being said, this tree is probably going to be cut down and turned into furniture or fuel at some point, so <laughs> enjoy it while it lasts, dwarves. And speaking of our dwarves, how are we doing over here? Okay, it looks like we're calm. It looks like we're peaceful. It looks like we're industrious. Very important. Keep at it, dwarves. And while they work away, how about, how about we get to know these guys a little bit better? We might as well. Now, this little expedition here was set up by this dwarf right here, Kivish Akrolzantir, Tin Anvil, or Tinny, as they typically call her. She's a dwarf of few words, generally, very private, and so we don't really know what is driving her exactly, but the others have come along willingly. Certainly, the assurance of glory would get any dwarf moving. I suppose it doesn't matter all too much why Tinny set up this expedition in the first place. It may well just be as simple as wanting to create her own place in history. A solid goal, and I think she's cut out for the job. As a side note, she does tend to hold her breath when she's nervous, and she does hold her breath a lot. She plays off that nervous nature pretty well. Tinny's favorite animal is a giant leopard seal. She likes them because of their fierce nature. And I mean, who wouldn't? Such powerful creatures. Now you may have noticed while we're talking here, Tinny's been in this carpenter workshop, and she's been very busy making some cages, a lot of cages, as many as she can possibly muster. We've got a bit of intel about these savage areas, places where dwarves tend to not venture, and some of it centers around the wildlife. I mean, there's, you know, it's gonna be dangerous wildlife wherever you go, a giant grasshopper's kinda spooky, but there's something different about this area and all savage, untouched areas. We've heard tell that the wildlife can become a bit aggressive, and so out of paranoia mostly, Tinny here is making these cages. We're hoping to get some cage traps set up as early as we can. A whole bunch of them too. Like, they would be very, very useful as defense, certainly. But they'd be double useful if we can capture those creatures and train them. Maybe we can get some new hunting creatures. Hunting grasshoppers? Hmm. I don't think it'd be possible, but we're open to the option here. Any who? Let's have a look down here now, underground in our little temporary burrow, which is looking rather nice. You can see we have a little entryway there, as well as our main meeting area. Those are food stockpiles around the sides, just so we can get the stuff inside. Maybe less rat problems that way, maybe. And then over on the side there, we have a little dormitory, and actually each of those beds is assigned to a particular dwarf. Makes things a bit more cozy that way, though. <laughs> you know, we could do better. We're gonna do better. Just temporary, again, you know? Also note we have all our dogs stuffed in here. With all those giant animals running around outside, we wouldn't want to risk any of our dogs running off and getting killed. And speak of the devil, there's Rofa again. Looks like uh, Rofa's found another giant grasshopper to munch on. I guess it has a favorite food. Who to thunk? And afterwards, it runs back to its shrine. Okay, so that's gonna be a regular thing. This whole area must be its hunting ground. It's unfortunately only a matter of time before the thing runs up towards our dwarves, I'm thinking. And so that being the case, I think it's time we start digging down underground, something our head miner, Moral, has been very excited to do. She seems confident that this place is going to be filled with riches, and that the aquifer below is not going to be too bad. I'd like to agree with her, but she can be a little overconfident sometimes, and she occasionally gets on the other dwarves' nerves. She can be a little ungrateful at points. Though that being said, it's not all negative when it comes to Pop here. Pop is what we have been calling her, and I suppose it has to do with one of her more endearing traits. She likes maize plants for their popped kernels. She won't shut up about the stuff. And generally speaking, she seems to have a great appreciation for the natural world, and really has gotten a kick out of all the wildlife around here. Her eyes practically burst out of her head when she first saw Highwood. Rather, popped out of her head, I suppose. You gotta love a passionate dwarf, even if they do test your patience from time to time. We have carved out a little bit underground here. We have some more plans too. This here is also going to be a temporary fortress, much like that one up above ground, but it's gonna be a little bit more permanent, okay? It's like a, a stepping stone. 
We do ultimately want a nice big fortress where we can kind of stretch out in, but this one here is going to do just fine for a good bit, I think. This over here is going to be a meeting hall, nice big area, and some space for workshops too. And we're going to have a bunch of very, very tiny bedrooms on the side. Not much bigger than that dormitory up top, but again, this is just kind of just a temporary place. We could see that, in fact, Pop was right above the aquifer. It wasn't too bad, but it is leaking some water down as we speak. It's coming down through this stairway here. That's going to be a problem. We're going to have to get that all sealed up. Don't want water leaking down into our new home. Uh, uh, also, of note, over here you can see this coiling hallway that's intended to go around that staircase. We're going to get a bunch of cage traps put in there. And so that way, animals or intruders or whatever is going to have to go through that long hallway filled with traps before they get to the dwarves. It'll be a bit safer that way. Should be done shortly. And look at all this stone, too. Plenty to work with. We're going to need to make some mechanisms ASAP if we want those cage traps ready. And we got some good dolomite for that, as well as some gypsum and some siltstone. And most importantly for us, we have some hematite over here. You see that? That rusty red color there. That means it's got iron in it, which is very, very good. We'll have arms and armor before long, I'm hoping. And what the hell? We'll get straight to them in a minute. Just noticing outside, we have a visitor of the reptilian variety. An alligator has wandered into the area. A large carnivorous hunting reptile. Not too big of a threat, I don't think. But what I am thinking is that this might make for a good first hunt. That's what we're here for, after all. How about we put these dwarves to the test and see what they're made of? Sounds like a plan. And looking back to the fortress, it looks like everyone's ready with their copper spears. Okay, all assembled up here. Excellent. Okay, dwarves, what do you think? I'm curious to see who will get that first kill. Good luck to you. And they're off this party of seven, hunting through the marsh. Now I'm going to note while they're traveling here that this party of seven is not really intended to get much bigger. Tinny set up this expedition with the express purpose that it would be small. Typically fame and fortune and glory and stuff makes things complicated. We want to keep things small here and, you know, still be able to make a name for ourselves. And by keeping a small group like this, it'll make our deeds magnified in terms of glory, right? That's what we're hoping for anyways. By keeping it simple, we will go down in history. It's a good plan. But for now, we should probably focus on this gator, huh? I think we're approaching. Let's go have a look at the thing. Ah, oh, yes, it knows it's being hunted now. It's not near water and is beginning to panic. It's trying to get away. And here come the dwarves. Hey, there we go. That's Queen Bee with first blood. Followed up by Boggy. And there's Wisp coming around the tree. And there's Tinny and the crab. And it's dead. No problem whatsoever. Put down by Tinny, actually. Just slammed into battle. <laughs> Showing all the others how it's done. Excellent work there. Good job, all. No injuries, no nothing. And you know, I'm just realizing that we were talking about making armor and weapons before this with that hematite discovery. But we have to deal with this alligator before it starts to spoil. Can't let it go to waste, you know? So we're going to get some workshops built. A whole bunch of them. And that includes a few over here at base camp. Metalsmith Forge, Craft Dwarf Workshop, Mechanic, Stoneworker. And down over here by the alligator, we're making a Butcher's Workshop and a Tanner Workshop. Gotta put that hide to use if we can. Get to it, dwarves! Now during that hunt, I mentioned a few names that you're not familiar with yet. Like Locum, the crab, over here. Not that he likes crabs or anything, he just has a very, uh, crustacean personality. He's crabby. Some would say dour as a rule. Don't know what the hell his problem is, he's just always kind of like that, he's been like that from the start, but the guy is an absolute artist when it comes to armor. He knows how to shape metal to a dwarven form perfectly. That's why we took him with us. The crab here is going to keep us armored up and perfectly safe from harm. As a bit of a side note, one of his favorite items is a bin. Which is strange, as an armor, you'd think he'd like a helmet or something, you know. But he just really likes the things a bin, you know. It's just a nice place to store things and keep things orderly. Seems to have a thing for him. I, I, it's a little weird, but, you know, to each their own. And, you know, I should say, before we go too hard on him for being a crab, he, you know, he's got a bit of a soft spot, too. He's not like a total crab, right? He's going to come out of his shell before long. And, you know, well, actually, speaking of which, he's been getting rather close with another one of our dwarves, who we'll introduce ourselves to now, Xan or Queen Bee, a skilled engraver and our designated woodcutter for the time being. She's kind of a bit different than Locum the Crab in that she's fairly bubbly and, you know, she's a little scatterbrained actually. A real good dwarf. She's endeared herself to everyone so far. And when it comes to a leadership position, she actually might be more suited to leader than Tinny, which is a bit surprising. I mean, Tinny's been a damn fine leader so far, but Queen Bee over here has a really good sense of social structure. She knows how to work with people and she has an amazing memory too. If something were to ever happen to Tinny, I'm sure Queen Bee here would take over in short order, and I'm double sure she would do an excellent job at it. She's got her nickname Queen Bee here because, well, the other dwarves claim it's because she seems like she could be the Queen Bee, like a real leader type, right? But secretly, it's because of her dress makes her kind of look like a beehive. Don't tell her. It was kind of a joke, but, you know, 
it did end up sticking, and so, yeah, there she is. Our engraver, Queen Bee. Now, you know, I guess we really haven't had a proper look at the date yet, but when we arrived here, it was right at the beginning of spring. And right now, we're at the beginning of summer, and we're starting to see some changes, like these rushes here starting to sprout up through the grass. See that? That's interesting. I'm curious how tall those get. Again, it's one of those things that we dwarves just don't see all too much. I don't think we could do anything with it, but it's still a unique part of our environment. Adds to the scenery a bit. But that's enough enjoying the scenery for now. If we have a look back over here at the base camp, things are coming right along, as you could tell. We have a bunch of workshops up now. Metalsmith Forge, Smelter, Woodburner. But where are the dwarves? Everyone's so busy. And well, as you can see, for the most part, they're down here in Stepping Stone Fortress number two. It's almost all carved out now. We're just getting the bedroom smoothed up. We can make cage traps now. And if you have a look up here, we do have some set to be put in up here at the entrance of our first fortress. That should get done soon enough. But something we could do that I thought would be pretty cool in the meantime is put some of our collected food to use. Right over here, you can see the crab grabbing some whip vine and bringing it down to a quern we had constructed down underground, getting it processed from rough vines down into a fine flower that we can hopefully do something with. And there we have it, whip vine flower. It's this lovely blue color. I will note too that that process took a long, long time. As you could tell, just looking at our meeting hall here, it's all smoothed up now. We've advanced quite a bit. Either we just need some more skill milling or we're gonna have to build some windmills up top. That process takes too long hoping it's worth it. That being said, we have another of our dwarves heading over as we speak, and he's hopefully going to take that flower and a couple other ingredients and turn it into something a little bit more palatable. This dwarf here is Boggy. He's our cook and brewer, and he's pretty darn skilled at this task too. He's been eager to see what ingredients we could find out here in the marsh, and I'm sure he's going to whip up something very tasty with what we can scrounge up. <laughs> It looks like he finished that meal. Let's have a closer look. Ah, three servings of alligator meat stew. The ingredients are minced whip fine flour, finely minced prickleberry, and well minced alligator meat. Well, that's not too bad at all, right? That flour did work out pretty darn well, kind of like a dumpling sort of a thing in there. And you got the prickleberries, thorns removed, of course, can't have that in there. And then we have that alligator meat. It's a bit stringy, but cooks up nice and tender. Any dwarf would be happy eating this. Yeah, and how about that Boggy? Certainly a unique fellow. He's quite portly, a victim of his craft. Very relatable. But overall, he's a very kind dwarf. Friendly. He's a little bit of a comedian, likes to take it easy, and also likes everything to have its proper place. He's a good rock. Keeps things stable and keeps our bellies filled. Even more important. <laughs> And actually, something, uh, as a new development with Boggy here. He has himself a, a love interest. It's looking like Boggy here is in a relationship with Tinny now. It's good to see. Now we have two couples in the fortress. Very interesting. Big Boggy and sturdy Tinny. They make a great pair, I think. Excellent work, Boggy. He's continuing to cook away as we speak. We'll leave him to his work. Oh, another, uh, distraction here, it seems. That didn't sound like Rofa, though, did it? My goodness, and sure enough, if we have a look down here at our butcher's workshop, it's still filled with those alligator pieces, and it looks like one of the locals has taken notice. Here we have a giant alligator, much like the one we took down, but <laughs> obviously much, much larger. And true to its name, the thing is gigantic, more than half the size of an elephant, actually. <laughs> Something like this could easily wreck one of our dwarves, or maybe all of our dwarves, too, if they got too close. We're not ready to take on something like this yet. But something that'll help us immensely, I think, in addition to the armor that Crab is making for us, are weapons. Weapons that will be produced by this dwarf right here. Wisp is her name. And right at the moment, she's grabbed a hunk of dolomite and is heading to the surface to turn it into steel, or rather, to turn it into pig iron, which we will then turn into steel. How about that? We are already producing steel here. Miraculous, really. Now, Wisp here is a rather reserved dwarf. She's named Wisp because she talks in a whispery voice, very soft-spoken, very mellow, very peaceful. And oddly enough, she doesn't really care for martial prowess or the idea of war at all. Couldn't really blame her, I suppose. War could be a bit of a nasty business. But it is strange that she is a weaponsmith who deals specifically in making weapons of war. Maybe she just has so much appreciation for weapons of war that she can't help but create them. She certainly does a fine job. And we are bound to put her skills to the test here. We're going to need her steel weapons. The best defense is a great offense, after all. That's what we dwarves say, and there's no denying that. Hey now, and have a look here. Wisp has just finished up her first weapon, and it's a spear. We're probably going to be mainly using spears here in the fortress. And this one here looks to be a beaut. It is a superior quality steel spear. And it already looks to have been claimed by Tinny. Excellent, we were going to give it to her anyways. But it looks like she snapped the thing right up. <laughs> Well, she deserves it, and there's going to be plenty more to come too, so no worries at all, dwarves. You'll all get your spears before long. 
Now then, having a look inside Stepping Stone Fortress number one, you can see it's in the process of being dismantled by the dwarves. Getting that furniture out of there, we've already gotten rid of the stockpiles, and that's because we're in the process of getting it all moved down here, down underground in Stepping Stone Fortress number two, which is pretty much all done. We just have to get some furniture in place. You can see the meeting hall there, a bunch of stockpiles, plenty of storage for food. That's kind of important. Got a couple of chests in there, tables, chairs, all wood furniture for the most part. We don't have access to a great amount of stone yet, so we figure what the hell. Chop, chop, right? If you have a look over at our stairway, you can see there's no water coming down anymore. Aquifer is all sealed up. We just have some cage traps to get in place and we should be good to go. Fortress is looking damn fine, but it still needs a few additional touches to call it home. Besides those cage traps over on the side there, you can see we're now going to dig out some downward passages that will lead down here to a large general use area that we're going to use for a multitude of tasks. It'd be a good place to throw some workshops, a new barracks, some offices for administrative duties, as well as a hospital. That's going to be very important. With so few dwarves, we have to keep everyone in tip-top condition. And the dwarf who's going to be in charge of this very important task is right over here, actually just hacking away at this piece of wood, much like he is apt to do with those in his care. This here is a gutter. It, it's kind of a joke, hopefully. <laughs> this guy is our medic, our surgeon, our diagnostician, our chief medical dwarf, and he is a bold one, which I guess we're hoping at this point is warranted. Like, it's one thing to be bold and have the skill to back up that boldness, but if you don't have that skill and you're still acting very boldly and confidently, then that could just be damaging, right? Gutter here is a real dwarf's dwarf when you get down to it. He likes his stone, he likes his gems, he likes picks and shields, and he enjoys taking people apart. I mean, what more could you want from a dwarf? <laughs> I guess what's more important is that he knows how to put them back together. Time will tell on them. And speaking of time, it looks like it's flying right by now. And in fact, at this point, we are in early autumn, which means the traders have arrived from the capital. Excellent. They're sure to have brought some interesting things, though as for stuff to trade, we really don't have that much. Some spare furniture, maybe. We were actually toying around with the idea of selling furniture to the traders, making that one of our main exports. It seems strange, but we have access to some pretty unique materials out here. It might be that the traders are willing to pay a little bit more for it, though this year it's going to be kind of uh, bottom of the barrel stuff, I think. And I guess really the traders haven't brought any wagons with them, so they're not going to be able to carry that much back home. We'll see what we can do. Okay, that's going to do it right there. We did trade a bunch of furniture, as well as a small handful of gems we found down underground, and in return we got some food. We got a bunch of cheap meat, fish, plants, as well as a few bits of thread for hospital usage, and a hen, too, which will come in handy. We can get eggs now. Really, all things considered, it wasn't too bad of a trade, and it certainly worked out in our favor. As a side note, we did have Gutter assigned as our broker during that trade, and he did a bang-up job. Seems that confidence really paid off, and I think he learned a thing or two as well. Yeah, we're probably going to keep him on as our broker. Hopefully he gets more competent at it in the future, and I'm sure he will. Now then, transitioning here a little bit and taking a look at our world map, we still don't have the best idea of where our fortress is. We should probably address that, as well as some news that we received from the merchants. A bit of concerning news, actually. Well, first off, just to get things in perspective, this is where we are up here, far to the north. In order to get to the capital, you have to go around the northern tip of the inky waters here and then through the coincidental jungles, and then you're there. And keep in mind, too, that Northbridge, our capital here, is fairly newly founded in the grand scheme of us dwarves. And this location is not where our dwarves originated. That would be down here. Another three days at least of travel. This here is the fancy Tooth Mountains. And scattered through here are a number of settlements. This is our homeland and site of our former capital, Copper Dots. Now, we've received some worrying news, as I said, from the merchants that the homeland is under attack. The capital is fine for now, I guess, but our homeland is under attack by both the elves of the Tame Canyon and the goblins of the Circular Terror. And I suppose that shouldn't be all too surprising, really. We've been having a lot of trouble with both those people lately. It looks like the elves have gone over the mountains and are attacking some of our eastern settlements, probably in airborne assaults, I would imagine. But the goblins are attacking a bit more directly. They're being very bold and attacking our former capital, Copper Dots. We've never seen such brazen attacks from them. They were giving our newly established capital, Northbridge, some trouble, but they haven't really been bothering our homeland. Well... I suppose it may seem callous, but I'm pretty glad we're away from that sort of harm. We have an entirely different list of concerns. <laughs> we'll keep our heads down. Not too terribly concerned about it. I'm sure it'll be fine. Right, dwarves? Right.
and would you have a look at this fortress really coming together now and it really didn't take that long either granted it's a tiny fortress but still we're only halfway through autumn right now and we have defenses nice bedrooms a well-furnished meeting hall and down below we now have a nice smooth out barracks and offices and a hospital and some nice storage area yes the spear cavern is coming right together this will serve as an excellent base camp as we head out into the bogs looking for prey to hunt or even more excitingly when we head down below where the real targets are down in those dark tunnels exciting we're gonna get to that soon too because remember this is only a stepping stone fortress a temporary thing we want one that's much bigger and the sooner we get looking the sooner we get finding but for now dwarves i think you deserve a little rest so drink up eat hearty and maybe do a little bit of training with those spears too because soon we hunt And with that, my bearded bastards, our episode proper is now concluded. And we are entering the portion of the episode where I want to talk about some behind the scenes things. Just in case you're unfamiliar with my videos, I like to do this at the end just because like, I like to be able to explain game mechanics or, you know, like reasons for certain choices or design decisions, that sort of stuff. But I don't like to cram it in during the actual episode kind of screws up the immersion you know so I kind of save it to the end here and you know it gives me a chance to talk about it a little bit candid you know now then spear cavern I can't recall a series I've ever started where I've went so hard on the first episode I'm having a lot of fun with it right now you know when I started this series or rather when I started recording this episode here I wasn't sure how <sighs> you know I wasn't really sure of much frankly I knew I wanted a rather small fortress, but like as I was recording, the number of dwarves I wanted to have in the fortress kept shrinking until I got like halfway through the episode and I was like, eh, maybe these seven dwarves are fine. It's been requested quite a few times that um, I try something like this and I've always kind of pushed back a bit because really when you get down to it, if you have a look at the individual dwarves, there's not that much differentiating them from one another a lot of the time, but that's not true you know you can always dash it up a little bit plus like they do have personalities and stuff it just doesn't come through all that much most of the time when you're playing but i figure if we just slow things down and took a closer look maybe we can see some interesting stuff some interesting interactions some fun little character moments or something i don't know it's a it's an experiment i've never done something larger scale with such a small scale idea before We'll see. I've got a good feeling about it, though. I think it's going to work out well. Also, I should mention, too, that this here is kind of part of a series, kind of part of a series. I'm continuing to run fortresses in the same world, Athera Etha. At this point, it's been like maybe seven months since I generated this world here. And when I generated it, I was playing a live stream on YouTube or something like when Dwarf Fortress first came out with a Steam release. And I was like, what the hell? Let's continue playing in this world, right? The first in the series is Nakortarad, or Dead Body is what the name of the fortress is. Just a small one, three parts. And that's followed by Northbridge, which took a bit to get through, but it's a longer series. It's, it's pretty good. And I also did like a one-off Legends mode overview sort of a thing, so we can gain some more context into this world. It's been pretty interesting. I don't think I've ever dug so deeply into a world before in Dwarf Fortress, so it's been nice to see everything kind of come together, you know? Even though I didn't really touch that much on the wider world in this episode here, I'm really trying to keep this one focused on the dwarves. At the start, anyways, you know? Don't want to get things too muddled talking about all kinds of other crap happening out in the world. All we need to know is that we have these seven ambitious monster-hunting dwarves out here in this terrible swamp to the north, and that will be good enough for me. Oh, and before I go a second farther, I hope you really liked the music during this episode. It was mostly composed by Ivan Dutch, maybe entirely composed by Ivan Dutch. At this particular juncture, I have not yet put the audio in place for this episode, but the guy's done an awful lot. And it's thanks to him that series like this come to life. Kind of helps to influence my mind when I'm thinking about stuff too. Just hearing the music, I don't know. Music is a very arcane thing to me. I am not a music maker. I just can't wrap my head around it, but Ivan Dutch seems to do perfectly well with it. Musicians are magical people. Trying to think of what else I want to touch on here. Ooh, one other thing I wanted to note is that I had mentioned at the beginning of this episode that it would be kind of cool if we could breed our own type of dog, right? Well, as it turns out, that is somewhat possible in Dwarf Fortress, which I think is amazing. I was doing a stream a while ago, and by the way, I don't do streams anymore. Just a heads up if you want to go looking for them. But somebody was telling me that you can breed animals and like their genetics will carry over or something like that. And I totally thought they were fibbing. 
but they kept insisting and they kept insisting and I was like, fine, let's give it a go here on stream. So I started up a fortress and like cranked up the game speed and had a bunch of rabbits, right? I, I think I started out with like, it was like 80 rabbits or something like that. And I picked out all of the white rabbits. And I think I had like four out of the 80 were white rabbits. And sure enough, I locked them all in together. And when they had more rabbit babies, they were all white rabbits. I didn't think that would happen. I, I mean, it's just you when you're playing Dwarf Fortress, you kind of assume a cool thing will happen if you do something, you know? And like nine times out of 10, it just doesn't work that way because the game just doesn't work that way. And I thought for sure that that would be the case with like, you know, genetics and stuff. But I guess that one's true. I just hope it's still in play here in the Steam version. I guess we'll see soon enough, though. I guess the important thing is not just the color of the animals, but like their traits. I do not know if certain traits carry over. Like if you have a muscular dog, if they have muscular puppies. I'm told that this is true, but I am not willing to believe it until I see it myself. That's just kind of how Dwarf Fortress works for me. Anyways, uh, what else? Oh, fan art. If you want to do some fan art of this episode, the characters that have popped up in it and whatnot, I would be absolutely delighted to show it off during these portions here at the end of the episode. Just got to send it over to Krugsmash at gmail.com with a title for the piece and what you want to be called too. I want to credit you, but just, you know, make sure to note that you don't want to be credited if that's the case. As long as your fan art has something to do with like the previous episode, then I'll show it off in the following episode during this part here. I appreciate it very much. I just like seeing people's interpretations of the crazy crap that happens in the game here. Always amazing. Anyways, my bearded bastards, I've probably rambled on for far too long here. And on that note, I hope to see you next time, in two weeks' time, here in Locum Kor Zugab Luluku Nobak, the Spear Cavern, the Grand Granite Shrine of Pillars. And until then, you bearded bastards. Whoosh.